Take your Bibles and open up again to the book of Romans, and, uh, and we'll begin there. Um, great days of, of, of ministry and, and opportunity, and uh, I, I've, I've really enjoyed thinking about these things, and um, we've, we've talked about the subject of nationalism before. Don't, don't start it yet, Tara, or did you? Okay. <laughs> Looking at um, secular or sacred, or sacred or secular, I always get those two kind of mixed up as to, I don't remember which one, I, which way I said it last, but um, the issue of, of speaking and addressing and focusing on the issues of our day from a divine viewpoint with a goal to establish divine viewpoint. I, I found that much of what we believe in the political realm comes right out of the Bible. And uh, uh, people don't realize they're, they're talking biblical principles when they're discussing some of these issues. But people need to know where it comes from, not just that you've got the answer, uh, the, the point, counterpoint, so, so to speak. Um, so we need in, it, in our day, as the foundations are crumbling, many of them are already gone. Uh, Psalm 11 verse 3 says if the foundations be destroyed what shall the righteous do? If you got nothing to stand on everything is sinking sand and shifting so we, we look at our world and the foundations are crumbling but our foundation stands sure the Lord knows them that are his and uh, while everything else is going to pot we can stand in the midst of the of the struggle and really really have a have a voice and have a message that works that uh, that that people need and so um, we've we've been through these different things um, the first foundation is the Apostle Paul he's the he's the wise master builder Romans chapter 1 verse 1 Paul a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God verse 5 by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles and we understand the big picture on the jigsaw puzzle box <laughs> that, that God had a plan and a purpose in place for 2,000 years revealing himself to the nation of Israel and a purpose for them that he interrupted with another apostle who wasn't one of the twelve and now sends him out into the Gentile world not with a Jewish message don't preach a Jewish message to a Gentile world it doesn't fit and don't try to make it a hybrid message kind of roll it together and and and, and warm it over and and try to make that fit because that it doesn't work and it will be helpful to the degree that you apply biblical truth but there is a tailor-made gospel that we have. And Paul here in Romans 1 gives us a history of the Gentile world. As he introduces the body of Christ now, 2,000 years removed from when Paul was saved in ministry, he had no idea he was writing things that were going to extend for people 2,000 years away from him. As, so as we as we're, we're far removed from the history in his day and that culture, but we read these things and it, it introduces us to God's perspective about the Gentile world and how he sees it and so we can look at it through his eyes and know how to reach it, know how to approach it. And those they say those that are that fail to know history are condemned to repeat it. Paul gives the history and why the world is, is the way it is. People, people want an answer. Why are things so chaotic? Hey, the world is going on right on the same course that it's always been. And so we see Paul gives the Gentiles their, his, their history in verses um, 18, 19, and 20. The wrath of God is revealed because, verse 19, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. He showed it to them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. It all starts with creation. And when Paul deals with the, the Gentiles, he starts at creation. We're studying the book of Acts. You know where Paul starts with the Jew? He starts with Abraham. We're looking at, in Acts chapter 13, his sermon, it's a it's his first sermon. It's a pattern for his Jewish ministry as he goes to the synagogues. 
He de- to a Jew, he becomes as a Jew. <laughs> to a Gentile, he becomes as a Gentile. He goes all the way back to Adam, doesn't he, in Romans. Goes all the way back to creation. A Jew knows there's a God because the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A Gentile knows there's a God, but he just denies it because he doesn't like the, the ramifications of it. So Paul says they know. Remind them of what they know. They have, there's the creation, there's the conscience, there account, there's accountability, they're without excuse. And he goes, he goes back to Genesis chapter 1 in creation. And of course, when you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you learn about the issue of volition, personal responsibility. God created man with an accountability and a responsibility to his creator and an awareness, responsibility and accountability, volition in Genesis 2 and 3 with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the one command that they couldn't, that they, that they had to obey and couldn't. So you see volition and responsibility. Then in Genesis 2 and 3, you see the issue of marriage. God lays out what marriage is because marriage is going to be the basic foundation building block of man and man's perpetuate. It, marriage is where offspring is designed to be produced. And the parents then then in the family and the home are the ones to carry on and pass on the principles from one generation to the next. So you see marriage in the home and then you see the home and family. In Genesis 4 you see Adam and Eve begin to have children. Cain and Abel and the strife in the family. You know why there's strife in the family? Because of the problems of Genesis 3 and sin entered into the world and now you're having those little bundles of joy (laughs) They bring into the world have the, the Adam began to begat a son in his own likeness. That's the problem, and so you have you have the development of civilization. You have strife in the family, and then the culture begins to develop in Genesis four, and in industry and arts and culture and agriculture and all those things go on in Genesis four. There the the world develops as man begins to multiply. And you have Genesis 4, and then you have Genesis 5 as the graveyard, where you have the genealogies from Adam all the way to Noah. And then what happens in the days of Noah? How's man doing in the process? The earth is filled with violence, and every imagination of man's heart is only evil continually, because man has a heart problem. And creation and conscience and volition and responsibility and marriage and the home and family is not enough to manage the affairs of man. And so God says, I'll wipe them out and I'll start over with, now go to, go to Genesis chapter 9, and there's another foundation that's necessary to, for man to manage his existence and to, to function here on planet earth. God gave man a commission to, 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 to multiply and, and fill the earth, and as he filled it up, it was corrupt, and God had to, had to start over. You have the flood in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and 9. As the, Adam and or Noah and his boys come out, and they're given the same commission. Genesis 9, 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Fill the earth. Go out and, and multiply. But there's another foundational principle that has to be added that God in His grace and His miraculous design begins to create here because the first three, volition, marriage, and the family, need need more structure because of the evilness of man to manage. Because if you don't have this fourth structure around it, you have chaos and mob rule. That's where you come to the flood, right? The earth is filled with violence and corruption, and man had corrupted his way upon the earth. So God establishes nationalism, a a framework whereby man can now have, have another entity around them to carry on and to manage the sinful nature and heart of man. And you drop down to Genesis chapter 9, um, verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. Will I require it? At the hand of man, uh, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. 
Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For he is in the image of God, for in the image of God made he man. He establishes the issue of law and the issue of capital punishment. Now, capital punishment is the extreme, right? That's the max punishment. If you, if you establish the max, wouldn't that kind of cover everything below? The issue of law and order administered by man and justice carried out as a deterrent or a punishment, more so punishment, that, that then will be a deterrent and preserve righteousness. So you see those things established and, 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 and Noah and his boys go out now and begin to, to replenish the earth. Um, Genesis 10 records the descendants of Noah's three boys. And in Genesis chapter 10, now these are the, verse 1, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, <coughs> Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. From verse 2 to 5, you have the sons of Japheth. And notice verse 5, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. And every one after their tongue, after their families, in their nations. You have national life begins. And notice the elements. You have isles. There's land. We, we read the passage in Deuteronomy where he, sta he establishes borders, territories for these nations. The three elements of national life are land, mass, and borders. Then divided in their lands, everyone after, their, after his tongue, language. Because what's he going to do in chapter 11? He's going to divide the nations with their language to, to split them up because they wouldn't do it on their own. So there's land, there's language. He says everyone after their tongue, after their families, there's, there's history and heritage that is passed down. Identi identity, there's a common identity in their nations. Those three things make up national life. Land, tongue, family, together, make up national life. Here's the sons of Japheth. Go down to verse number 20. These are the sons of Ham, after their families. There's family, that's Noah's middle son. After their tongues, there's language. In their countries, there's the land and boundaries in their nations. See those same three things. Then verse 21, you have the, the son of, uh, of Noah, Shem. And you have his descendants. Drop down to verse 31. These are the sons of Shem. After their families, in their, after their tongues, in their lands, those same three elements, after their nations. The, the element of national life that God establishes is family. That's the, the common heritage. And um, then you have language. And then you have boundaries, country. He set the bounds of their habitation. Paul talks about that in, in uh, Acts chapter 17. And those three things make up culture and national life. Verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. By these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. God gave the commission to Noah, didn't he? Replenish and fill the earth. Man says no once again, doesn't he? That, that now you have the Tower of Babel. God's going to tell you how he did it and when he did it. He did it at the Tower of Babel, and he, he um, expands on that, that, that division of the sons of Noah. And you know the story of the Tower of Babel. And, and he lays those things out there. Um, if you back up in, in Genesis chapter 10, verse number 25, as, you, as you're going through the genealogy of Shem, and we did this as we, as we looked at uh, some things in the first 11 chapters of Genesis in Sunday school a little while ago. He says in verse 25, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, 
For in his days was the earth divided. As you take the genealogy here at the end of chapter number 11 and you, you draw yourself the, 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 the genealogy and the timeline, you get to the boy Peleg and you find out that it's a certain number of years and in his days was the earth divided. Not only did God separate the nations by language, he created a physical difference in the way they talked so that those, those three families and they're, and they're, they're, they're splitting into the, their, their national identities couldn't communicate with each other. He created a physical difference. He reprogrammed their brain, if you will, <laughs> so they couldn't communicate. It was at that time that he also split the continents into what we now see in the, in the global map. You see, like, like, the, like the continents can almost fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And there was a gradual shifting of the continents to separate man. By the way, when Christopher Columbus came to America, it was already populated, wasn't it? There were people already here. There were people already in South America. Because they all came from one place, right? They had to come. They started after, after Noah. God split. It was also at that time that God created the ethnic differences, the physical characteristics of the races. People, people wonder when, when, where all that came from. It wasn't the sunshine in South Africa or the, the, the cold climate up in, up in the north. And God divided them for a purpose. He divided them. He, Paul says, go to, uh, go to, go to Acts. Hold on here because we're coming back. Go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. See, Paul does the same thing. He talks about this. When he deals with the Gentiles, he, he talks about their history. Um, Genesis, or Acts 17, verse 24. Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not with temples made with hands. See how he talks about creation? Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You see how Paul just talks like they already know that? He's not trying to convince them because the Romans 1 tells us they already know. They know and understand. They just hold the truth and unrighteousness. Verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, that word nations there, I believe, is where we get our word ethnicity from. They all came from one source, but the ethnic differences were part of God's dividing the nations back in Genesis 11, 10 and 11. For to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. There's the borders, there's the land masses. When he, he tells Abraham or tells Moses, remember when God divided to the nations their inheritance according to the number of the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 32, right? We read that. What's the number of the children of Israel? Twelve. So there are twelve quadrants. God knows where they are. Maybe we can't identify them. But God separated. He created the, the ethnic things with the, with the differences in language and separated it. Why? That they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. If man is just left to dwell all in the same place, what happens? Chaos and upheaval and violence and selfishness. So he separates them so that witness of creation out there, they can seek the Lord and maybe, maybe find him find through, the, through the creator. You see, see all of that there. So go back to Genesis. So you see... That's where Paul says in Romans 1, God gave them up. You know, at Babel, they were supposed to replenish the earth. There was, a, there was an established understanding of the Creator, but what did man do? He created his own religion. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and they, they, they change the image of the incorruptible God into four-footed beasts and creeping things. And they invented their own religion. And God says, okay, you don't want me? I'm going to let you go on your merry way. 
and he gave them up three times in Romans 1. He gave them up to, a, to, to, to the lust of their own hearts, to, to dishonor their bodies, and to a reprobate mind. Away they go. But the principle of nationalism still exists. Because what does God do in Genesis 12? He begins to establish his own nation. And now, if God is going to set up a nation with language and culture and family history and boundaries, here's going to be the example. Here's, how, here's God's design for national life. He separated them that way, but even, even then, man following his conscience doesn't work. Let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> Well, it depends on what, what's guiding your conscience. <laughs> so God sets up a nation, and he does so as an example to teach us the, the, the design of nationalism. And he begins to form his own nation, the nation of Israel, from Genesis 12 all the way to Acts chapter 8. Right? And we have the scripture. And the, God does something interesting, though. You know, as you read your Bible... Go over, to, go over to Genesis chapter, 11, uh, chapter 14. While Abraham and the nation of Israel is being conceiving, conceived and growing and, and, and getting established with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Genesis 14 gives us a little snapshot. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> Genesis 14 gives us a picture. Well, how are the Gentiles doing while God's dealing with Abraham? Genesis 14... It came to pass in the days of Aphrael, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eleazar, Chedomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. So here's all these groups with their own nation and culture and language and family heritage and background that these made what? War. With Barak, king of Sodom, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and on and on. And what Genesis 14 is going to tell us is that Gentile national life is messy business. Because these guys are going on in their own darkness, going on in their own way, in their idolatry, and they're just, they're just they're going right back to where things were before the flood. Because the problem is not your ethnicity <laughs> or your heritage or your language or your environment. What's the problem? sin. You came, you, you came from Adam and man has a heart problem. And you go down through the passage and it's struggle, it's turmoil, it's bloodshed. Verse 4, 12 years they served Chedomer and in the 13th year they rebelled. They, the Gentile nations, they make alliances, they have friendships, common interests, and then they fight amongst each other. Verse 5, in the 14th year, um, the kings of Chomar and the kings that were with him smote the Rephaims. Verse 7, in the middle of the verse, smote all the country of the Amalekites. Verse 8, the end of the verse, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. Verse 11, and they took all the goods of Sodom. Verse 12, and they took Lot. Struggle and conflict and war and taking and pillaging Verse 14, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. They, they had to have weapons to, to conquer one another and to rescue one another and allies and so on. Uh, verse 15, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them. See the battle and the conflict and the struggle? <laughs> Does that sound like Gentile? That's, that's Gentile life. That's the natural order of things. Lastly, verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after the return from the slaughter of Chedo -lam Lammer. Bloodshed. You see all that? That's a picture, that's a snapshot in time of Gentile life while God's over here forming his nation. And Genesis 14 tells you that na Gentile, the Gentile national life is messy business. Isn't that what Paul says in the end of Romans chapter 1? 
being filled with all unrighteousness and, and ungodliness and abusers of their own selves and uh, that whole long list there. Paul, Paul t- you know, just nails it. So Gentile, when Paul goes out into the Gentiles' world, they have a history. They have been functioning in their own darkness for now 4,000 years, man has. And Paul now goes out into that arena, not with a Jewish gospel. The Jewish gospel won't fit. The Jewish gospel is based on on Israel's history and the promises and the identity and the covenants that they had. Paul goes out into the darkness with a tailor-made gospel for the Gentile world. Not to fix the Gentile world, but it's among the nations. He's going to reach individuals in the nations. Because the nations... And the, the world is on a course, right? Ephesians chapter 2, the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air, walking according to the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the mind, and by nature, Paul, had, Paul didn't realize now that his gospel would go out into a Gentile world spanning 2,000 years multiple custom, in multiple cultures and the, the progression of technology and all of that, Paul had no idea. And yet we have a message that's tailor-made <laughs> for that world. In the midst of all of that, God is forming his nation. Here he's going to raise up, here's what a nation under God looks like. <laughs> whose, whose God is the Lord. Go to, go, to, go to Exodus chapter 12. And the principle of nationalism... The, the, the structure and the order of nations is seen with Israel as an example. Now, we don't follow Israel's doctrine, but the structure and order that's there will teach us what a nation should be. One nation under God. <laughs> now, Israel had God supernaturally over them, didn't they? Protecting them and intervening and working with them. It, people do a disservice when they talk about America as God's nation. As though God superintended the, the rise of the nation and he had his hand upon the nation and intervening. No, that's the, we're in the dispensation of grace, right? What you have, it's the other way around. It's the nation that is closest to God's design for nationalism will prosper the most. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. So here's you, you want to know the principles for a nation under God? Exodus chapter 12 is the birth of Israel as a nation. They've grown to a multitude there in Egypt, around 6 million people. Um, I think it's about 6 million people. Um, maybe it's two. I'm drawing a blank right now. But that nation comes out of Egypt. That is the birth of Israel. You have the conception, the gestation for nine months, you know, the, the analogy. Then what happens at the end of the gestation? Birth. And it's a traumatic thing. And you see all those things fulfilled. You know, about being born again. When was Israel born the first time? When they came out of Egypt. They were born physically as a nation. They need to be born spiritually, born again spiritually. They will at the kingdom. Different, different study. Exodus chapter number 12. Verse number 48. Exodus chapter 12 verse 48. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and it be as one born in the land. No uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. You know what God's policy for nations are when it comes to immigration? Oh, there's a hot topic today. You know what it is? It's assimilation. To maintain the identity of the nation. You know what the emphasis today in the world is? Globalism. 
and internationalism. The breaking down of the individual identities of nations. No, God's design, here is a similar, what was God's design for Israel? That the Gentiles would come in, they were, they're welcome, aren't they? But they had to blend in and assimilate with Israel. What was the problem with this? Why did Israel eventually decline and fall apart? Because they were corrupted. They didn't remain separate from the Gentiles and adapted their culture and adapted their, their, their manners of life. And it led to their decline morally and spiritually. Verse 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn. There's the natural. And unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Just like Genesis chapter 9, the issue of law. You know, man was following their conscience, and that wasn't enough. So God with Noah establishes the principle of government and law. Law and order. Because if man is left to himself without a common standard, what's he going to do? He's going to follow his heart and his conscience. The principle of law. Go to Exodus chapter number 19. Israel has elders. They have a priesthood. They have a structure of leadership there. Um, they're, 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 in Exodus 19 and 20, God gives them the law, doesn't he? The Ten Commandments. <laughs> this is fascinating. Um, Exodus 19, verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. What were the words that the Lord commanded him? The law. Verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Well, that was a boast for one thing. But you know the other side of that? You know what you have? You have the consent of the governed. <laughs> you have the people agreeing together this is the law that we're going to follow. What a concept. <laughs> National identity has already been established. Now God is going to give them their constitution and the rule of law. Chapter 20, you have the Ten Commandments. Okay, The Ten Commandments establish the moral foundation of the nation. And within those Ten Commandments, there is the... Um, Verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, thou shalt not make to thee a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow themself, thyself down to them and so on. The moral compass, morality comes from God. Morality is not defined by individual choice. You have... He's the creator. He put the conscience. He gave man volition and responsibility. He is, in Israel, you have marriage and the home and the home and family. And then you have the rule of law that man and the national identity acknowledges the creator. There's the final authority. There's the author of morality. And we agree together that we will follow that law and that will preserve order in our nation. Without the rule of law, you have chaos. Can you imagine playing football without an official, without rules, and every man for himself? There would be no quick whistle for encroachment offside. You know, how, how chaotic that would be? And in a football game, there's always going to be somebody that isn't going to be happy with the call. I think back, remember the fail Mary for the Packers back in Seattle? I don't know what year that was. It was 2011, 2012, 2013, something like that. When the officials were on strike and they stepped on the field and they had the substitute refs and everybody's complaining about the referees and finally at the, at the end of the game, one, one official says touchdown and the other official says interception. <laughs> What chaos, you know? You need order. Can you imagine driving on the highway without rules of the road? You know, <laughs> kind of driving 
some places it's the way every man for himself, right? Yeah, yeah. Why do you have road rage? Because the nature of man. My, my right. I'm first. You cut me off. I'm in a hurry. You know, look out. You know, lay on the horn. My signal doesn't tell. It tells you what I'm going to do, not what I want to do. <laughs> you know how that works. If you don't have order, you have chaos. Genesis chapter 21. I'm sorry. Exodus 21, 22, and 23. You have the judgments for social life in the Mosaic Law. You have the moral law in the Ten Commandments. You have the judgments in 21, 22, and 23 that govern the social life. Servants and family authority. Genesis 21, verse 17. 21, 17. He that curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. There's the authority of the family, mom and dad. Um, verse 16. Uh, no. Uh, what do I want? Chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 16. If a man entice a maid that is betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely be put to death. Uh, uh, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If the father utterly refuse to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. There is the establishment of marriage, a marriage covenant and procedure there. Um, the, and the issue of sexual sin. Where's the one I'm looking, I'm looking for? Um, huh, I can't find it now. I got my new Bible. I don't have all the notes in it yet. Remember, what happens if you kill a woman that's with child? It's worse than just killing, you know, you're killing two. There's the sanctity of life and the unborn in, in a nation. Um, all these things. You have the laws for servants. You have equal justice for all. Um, you have the judgments governing the social life. Chapter 22, verse 2. Chapter 22, verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be, and be smitten and die, he sh there shall no blood be shed for him. There you have laws against theft. You know what that demonstrates? Personal property rights. So the sanctity of your possessions versus somebody wanting to take those things. You have, you have a, a uniform standard of social conduct. Chapter 24, you have a religious foundation, a spiritual foundation. In chapter 24 through 31, you have the tabernacle and the worship structure set up. So there is a spiritual foundation within the nation. Here, that's God's design for his nation. Now, God didn't have his hand on America supernaturally guiding it, creating all of those things. What did you have? You had one nation under God. You had the individual and the founders of that nation looking to him. They came out of a monarchy over in Britain with the throne and the kings and so on. They didn't want a king because that was too corrupt. So what did they create? They create a representative republic. Israel had elders that, that were part of each tribe that were judges that, that judged the people. They were recognized and known and acknowledged. So all of a sudden you see you know, people say uh, you know you're just, you're just imposing your form of government. Somebody had said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the rest of them. <laughs> right? You know, whatever system you pick, you know, there's, there's going to be problems in it because you've got men running things. But here's God's design for national identity and national life. And the closer a nation follows that design of border, language, and culture, and preserving its heritage in, in, in voluntary acknowledgment of their creator as the author of morality and right and wrong with a spiritual foundation to it, it's going to be ahead of the game, right? 
But as the foundations be destroyed, the same thing that happened with Israel, because they didn't adhere, and they, 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 they corrupted themselves, and they, they, they began to in decline, the same thing will happen naturally to a nation that starts out with the proper foundation and the fo proper, proper principles, and yet as it, as it departs from that, the, the moral and social and cultural decline will be inevitable. Welcome to <laughs> the future. My point is, as we think about the issue of national identity, the national issues, here is the filter by which we approach those things. And today, the issue of nationalism is a dirty word in some circles. And the issue of God, I actually had a conversation here recently with somebody, you talk, we're talking about slavery, and oh, the Christians were right there with, with the, the, you know, the slave trade. Uh, people look at Christianity and the Bible and God as part of the problem. See, we look at the, the issue of Christianity and the Bible that even though there was corruption, slavery, for example, was a worldwide phenomenon. It didn't exist just in the Western new nation of America. It was worldwide. And yet within our founding, because our founders recognized that all men are created what, equal, within the fabric of our founding was part of the answer to the problems of a new nation in a Gentile world. Follow? And it doesn't mean that everything is perfect and everything is hunky, because Gentile life <laughs> is still messy business, right? But here are the principles to help manage sinful mankind living in the same area and the, the issue of acknowledging of the creator and morality from him and the, the sanctity of the family and marriage and the, the proper identification of marriage because marriage is the building block of the home and the home is the building block of the culture and the, the building block of society and nationalism is to protect those first three. And so as, as, you, as, as marriage declines the home declines. As the home declines and is broken up, so goes the nation. It's a, it's a cause and effect kind of a thing. So we see all of that. And so what we, what we have, those foundations of nationalism and the rule of law, I'll show you one, one last thing. I think this is neat. Look at Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. Now you're going to think I'm being silly. But I've never done that before, have I? You got Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7. So here is God's 24 7 design for a nation, okay? Moses, and he took the book of the covenant. There is a written standard that is available, an authority, there's no question, it's settled. He took the book of the covenant, read it in the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. There you have the consent of the governed to a uniform standard that they're going to agree to to resolve differences and to punish evil and to carry on their national life. You have one nation under God. A rule of law, consent of the governed, equal justice. He says one law for the home born as for the stranger. Uh, all the people agree to it. Crime and punishment is based on the choice and the actions of whoever <laughs> and the nation is launched. And for a while they do pretty well until you get to the book of Judges. <laughs> And every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And the breakdown of the, the, the rule of law and the settling of disputes. If you, don't give, if you don't give the rule of law the chance to arbitrate and you think the law itself is the problem, you know what you have? 
you have anarchy. And nobody agrees because the law is the problem and the system is the problem. Therefore, when we see something that we don't like, <laughs> up the uprising. And you have anarchy. And so it goes. See, see, these principles give you something. Now, again, Gentile life is messy business because it's, you have corruption in the leadership, don't you? Um, so it's, it's not a perfect science. But here are some of the things about the design for nations. Go to Romans chapter 13 and we'll quit. When we talk about these, when we begin to talk about these social issues and the issues of our day, here are the foundations and the framework that a believer is to approach them with. Our apostle, the grace given to Paul, the, the, not the kingdom program, not the kingdom law, but the, but the grace given to Paul for the Gentiles. We recognize the issue of creation. and our cre See, evolution, when evolution was in, in, introduced into the education system, what did it begin to do? It began to cut away at the fabric of the nation at the very first foundational level. And if the, if the very first foundation is destroyed, what's going to happen to the rest of it? So you have creation and conscience. You have personal choice and responsibility and accountability. You have the proper identification of the marriage, of, of, of what marriage is, and gender, and the home, because the home is where the, the training goes for the next generation and the next generation. And then you have the family, the extended life, and then you have the national structure around it to preserve those things. And you look at that, and, and you, then you look at the way that the nation of Israel was set up. You know when Israel began, they, they, they began to climb, they said, we want a king, just like the rest of the nations. And they got outside of God's design. God says, okay, if that's what you want, <laughs> be careful what you wish for, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Israel, because they... They, they, it was a spiritual problem that led to the fall and decline of Israel, wasn't it? And so it is, first and foremost, with America. So I hope that gives you some framework. And see, so, and sometimes when we discuss the issues of our day, the talking points are come from good moral values. But see, we're not pointing people to a hero or to a party or to a philosophy of government, who do we ultimately point people to? The creator. Because he's the one that's going to meet the need in the human heart. If they're lost, they need the gospel of the grace of God. If they're saved, they need the word of God rightly divided to work in their lives to live in, the, in this messy world that we live in. Amen? And that's where we come in. We have the pillar... The local church is the pillar and the ground of what? The truth, the truth that God has today for the dispensation of grace. We've got a big job ahead of us. And praise the Lord that we can be a light. And there's all these other little lights. They're, they're not as big as some of the other lights, <laughs> but it's what the world needs. And we, go, and we go to reach individuals here and there and rescue, take them out of the, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of the adversary and making an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And when you do that, then you can function in this world because you're functioning for him. And he'll take care of the mess at the second coming. <laughs> right now, we're, we're here as ambassadors for Jesus Christ and the message of grace and peace through a, a savior that's now offered to every single man, woman, and child. An unrestricted message, no division, no preferential treatment for the Jews. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we can share that wonderful message. And you know, when, when people are ready, like Sergius Paulus was in Acts 13, <laughs> they grab onto it because, yeah, it works. And otherwise, you know, most of, the, most of the time you're out there in the world and you're rubbing, the, you're rubbing the fur on the cat, but the cat's going the wrong way. <laughs> and you're going against the grain. And that's okay, because it's always been that way. Right? 
And so uh, next week we'll begin to talk about some of these issues, try to look at them from a, through the filter of God's Word to know how to think about them. And our young people need to know how to think about them too and uh, to have that foundation built under because they go out there in that world in the education system and it and it's, sounds good and it's to overthrow all of that because at the root it's human wisdom and human viewpoint that doesn't want the accountability to the creator and so therefore they invent their own wisdom because they're, they're professing themselves to be wise they become fools okay well, what a great what a great opportunity! I don't be, I don't say all this to incur, to discourage you. I say it to encourage you, so we can go forth with clarity and with confidence. Whatever whatever comes down the pipe, because the, the 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 nation goes like this, doesn't it? But sometimes the the the, the downward spirals are deeper. But it's always it's always like this. You know, it's always. Because that's, that's the direction of the course of this world. But so we're going like this. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. What a joy. And it's the life of Christ in our hearts. He gave you his life so that he could represent, so you, so you could take him in this dark world. Anyway, plenty of time gone by. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at these things. We thank you for the gospel of the grace of God, the new message that goes out to the Gentile world of an everyman savior, not needing a priesthood, not needing a mediator, but can go directly to the cross work and the person of our savior and the work that was provided there for them. And Father, as we preach that gospel, we strike that nerve that is in every individual's heart. There is an awareness of who you are. There is an awareness of accountability. There is an awareness of the, of, the, of the fact that we don't measure up and that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we're really honest, we, we acknowledge that. And the only, the only answer is not found in ourself and it's not found in a religion of human effort. It's found in the person of our Savior and the life that he has given to us. And we just rest in that for eternal life and for daily life. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.